Oh, wait, I have to let you share. Okay, now you can share the screen. So okay. we get rid of this, yeah. So. Okay. Good. All right. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Welcome uh, everyone to Zach seminar. Uh, it's my big pleasure to introduce Jack Rogers from University of Manchester. Uh, Jack is a final year PhD student of Henrik Seuss. And uh, Jack will uh, talk about his uh, recent result about case stability of smooth final threefold with the action of SL2 group. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, uh, hello everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Ivan for inviting me to give this talk and all of the other hosts for organizing this seminar. Uh, as, he, as he said, I'm going to talk about the case stability of smooth final threefolds admitting SL2 actions. So, right off the bat, the um, the interest in the topic of case stability all comes out of uh, the existence of Kähler Einstein metrics. So if you have a compact manifold of even dimension, uh, Kähler metrics are very important in complex geometry. They give mutually compatible Riemannian complex and symplectic structures on X. The natural question to start with is if uh, X is a Kähler manifold, does there exist some sort of canonical Kähler metric within the uh, Kähler class of the one you already have? Um, the most important, probably, class of canonical Kähler metrics are the Kähler Einstein metrics. These are the ones that satisfy this condition down here, where the Ricci curvature is proportional to the metric itself. Um, these are of interest for various reasons, one of which is that um, this condition here implies that the manifold has constant scalar curvature. It's obviously a very de desirable property. So the new question is, do Kähler Einstein metrics always exist? Can we always find one? Given a Kähler manifold, can we always find a Kähler Einstein metric? Um, first step towards answering this question is to look at the first churn class. First churn class is defined by the cohomology class of the Ricci sensor, um, and it's independent of omega within a given uh, cohomology class. Now, the Ricci tensor here, if, if you have a Kähler Einstein metric, is proportional to the metric. Since the metric is positive definite, if this condition holds, then the first churn class defined here is going to be definite in the sense of the corresponding form is positive or negative, definite or zero. So you can then split the question of whether Kähler Einstein metrics exist into these three cases where the first shown class is negative, zero or positive. Uh, the first two cases, negative and zero, have been solved since the 1970s. And in these cases, Kähler Einstein metrics always exist and they're always unique. Uh, more interesting case and the more difficult one is when the first shown class is positive. Uh, it's been known since the 1950s so that there are obstructions to the existence of Kähler Einstein metrics in this case. For example, if the automorphism group of X is not reductive, then X does not admit a Kähler Einstein metric. And an example in this case is the blow up of projected plane at a single point. This is a uh, this is a manifold with positive first shown class, which does not admit a Kähler Einstein metric. Okay. So Given this issue, where there are obstructions to the existence in first, first shown class positive case, um, a conjecture kind of was eventually formulated by mostly Yao, Chan, and Donaldson, where they were basically attempting to translate this problem into a purely algebraic geometry context. Um, this, this was ultimately solved by Chen, Donaldson, and Sun in 2012, who proved that a smooth complex finite variety admits a Kähler Einstein metric if and only if it is K stable. And case stability is, is a purely algebra of geometric condition, um, which I will go on to define now. So the idea of case stability is it is a sort of a positivity cri uh, criterion associated to a numerical variant given by certain degenerations of your variety called test configuration. So a test configuration is essentially a family of, de of degenerations of your variety indexed over the affine line where everything has this C star action, the natural C star action on the affine line lifts up to this degeneration. And uh, what this means is that the fibers over all non-zero points of the affine line in this degeneration are isomorphic to the original variety X. And all the interesting stuff happens in the fiber over zero. Um, one sort of extra definition here is that we call a test configuration special if the fiber over zero is normal. We call this a central fiber. And this is where all the action happens essentially. So. Given a test configuration for X, um, the Donaldson-Futaki invariant is associated with the action of C star 
induced on the space of global sections of the central fiber. Um, I won't go into the specific definition of the Donaldson Fitrachian variant, but the point is that um, X is case stable if uh, the Donaldson Fitrachian variant is non negative for all test configurations and um, only zero for the trivial test configuration. Now, I said all test configurations. Actually, it turns out that you only need to check the special test configurations. These are the ones, as I remind you, there where the central fiber is normal. So if the central fiber is not normal, you don't need to check the Donaldson Fitrachian variant. And this is quite important, which will come up again later. So now we have this new condition that implies the existence of K line Einstein metrics. And the question is, how do you check it? Problem is, in general, any given variety is going to have infinitely many test configurations, which I knew calculate the Donaldson Fitrachian variant of all of them all at once for the most part. Um, so case stability on the face of it is actually very difficult to check. Um, so now you have to kind of work out ways to get around this and make it a bit more easy to check whether a given variety is actually case stable, because ultimately we want to prove the existence of Kähler Einstein metrics. So one way to do this is to exploit symmetry of your varieties. If you have a highly symmetric variety, you have some reductive group acting on it, you can look for equivariant test configurations. So essentially you, you have this family here and you then want this to be equivariant with respect to your G action as well. And for this C star action to also commute with your G action. And it was proved by Datar and Zekel Hedi in 2016 that um, you can check case stability. Uh, you can show the proof of the existence of a Kähler Einstein metric by checking the Donaldson Futaki invariant only of these equivariant special test configurations. Now, in the case where your variety is highly symmetric, this, this group G uh, is very large. This can make case stability much more easy to check by essentially you can reduce the number of test configurations you need to look at down to finitely many or sometimes even just one. Um, so to give a kind of sense of one of the variables that determines how useful this is as a method, there is a invariant of this group action called the complexity. So if you have a connected reductive group G acting on X, you take a Borel subgroup B in G, this is a maximal solvable subgroup, um, the complexity of this action of G on X is the minimum co-dimension of the Borel orbits in X. So if the Borel subgroup has an open orbit, um, this is going to be co-dimension zero. The complexity of this action is going to be zero. If all of the Borel subgroups orbits are very small, then the, they're going to have high co-dimension and the action is going to have high complexity. It's much more difficult to deal with actions when there are lots of very small orbits. Another kind of way of measuring this is um, Complexity is also equal to the transcendence degree uh, of the field of B invariant rational functions on X. So again, if you have lots of different B invariant rational functions, this is quite a complex action. And if you don't have any, then the action is quite simple. Um, give a familiar example. If uh, your group G is a torus, then the G varieties of complexity zero are exactly the toric varieties. And as in the case of toric varieties, there's a sort of well-known combinatorial description of a toric variety in terms of cones and fans and polytopes for um, arbitrary reductive groups. And as long as the complexity is less than or equal to one, there is a combinatorial description known and possible um, for these varieties that sort of generalizes the description of toric varieties by fan. So the goal then becomes when you have these highly symmetric varieties, you have these combinatorial descriptions and you can use them to show case stability. So looking at some of the previous cases that have already uh, that have already worked with this method um complexity is zero and your group is a torus again this is the toric varieties uh, a condition for case stability was found by wang and shu in 2004 uh, if the complexity is one and you still have a torus action then uh ilton and seuss found a condition for case stability in 2015. the case where the complexity is zero and you have an arbitrary reductive group um, these are called the spherical varieties. The condition for case stability was found by Delcroix in 2016. And I am looking at this case here. So you have a complexity one action by an arbitrary reductive group on your variety. And you want to use this combinatorial description to find conditions for case stability that are practical to check. Um, so to give an example of one of these conditions, if you have a smooth finite toric variety, there is an associated polytope. Um, and it, the variety X is case stable if and only if the barycenter of the dual polytope is the origin. Um, and the, you know these these other cases work in similar ways. 
but more complicated. So now I have to uh, kind of describe how this combinatorial description actually works. So if you fix K, a finitely generated field extension of the complex numbers, and you let G, a connected reductive algebraic group, act on K birationally, you fix a birational class of um, normal varieties with G actions with function field equal to K. And then there is a set of a sort of machinery, the Vust theory that Luna and Vust um, developed in the 1980s, which essentially classifies up to isomorphism varieties within this birational class that you get by fixing K. The way this classification works is by looking at the valuations of the G-stable and B-stable divisors in X, again, where B is a Borel subgroup of G. Um, so we look at this set here, V, which is the set of G valuations. These are just the valuations corresponding to the G-stable divisors in X. And this set DB, the set of colors, and the colors are divisors on X, which are B-stable, but not G-stable. They're prime divisors specifically that are B-stable, but not G-stable. These are called colors. Um, and Lunavos theory classifies varieties with respect to the, some data associated with these sets V and DB. And Dmitry Chimashov in the late 1990s applied the Lunavos theory to give a combinatorial description uh, for complexity 1G varieties, which essentially is a very vast generalization of the description of toric varieties by fans. So some of the things we'll have to keep track of in order to make this combinatorial description work are the semi-invariants. These are the rational functions on a variety such that your Borel subgroup acts via a character. So these are essentially like eigenfunctions for the um, action of the Borel subgroup on the function field of X, um, acting by some character chi. There's a very useful lemma of Friedrich Knopp, which essentially says that most questions you can ask about functions in K and valuations on K can essentially be answered only by looking at the semi-invariant functions. Most of the, if you know how things behave with respect to semi-invariant functions, you know how they would behave with respect to everything else as well. So we have the set KB of semi-invariants, and then we want that for each weight chi, we'll have a subset of semi-invariants of weight chi. Um, we also want to keep track of the weight lattice of X. This is the set of, this is the set of weights of B such that there exists a non-trivial semi-invariant of weight chi. Uh, this is a free abelian group, it turns out. So given this, we have a split exact sequence where we embed the B invariant functions into the B semi-invariants, because an invariant is just a semi-invariant of weight one. And then we map a semi-invariant function here to its weight in the weight lattice. This gives us an exact sequence and it's split because lambda is free abelian. Um, so we get a splitting map E, where we essentially choose a weight and map that weight to a function where B acts via that weight. Um, importantly enough, this, uh, this splitting map is not canonical. Um, in the spherical case, there are um, complexity zero case. For any given weight, um, there are up to constants, there is only one semi-invariant function of that weight. So in that case, your splitting map E is actually canonical, but in our case for complexity one, um, you can multiply any semi-invariant of weight chi by a B invariant function and you will get a different one of the same weight. Um, so this splitting map is not canonical. Okay, so as I mentioned, the, um, the valuations, the G valuations, the G invariant valuations corresponding to the G invariant divisors, they're determined by the restriction to the semi-invariant functions. Um, and in light of the fact that this exact sequence splits, we can look at the semi-invariant functions essentially as consisting of, of weights and invariants. So the restriction to the semi-invariants is actually then determined by a functional on the weight lattice, which we call L, and then the restriction of that valuation to the field of B invariants. Now, since the complexity is one, the transcendence degree of KB over the complex numbers is also one. Um, and so essentially we know that KB is the function field of um, some smooth projective curve. It turns out that in all the cases of interest to us, and I'll sort of briefly explain why this is in a minute, um, it turns out that that curve is actually just a projective line. So the field of B invariance is always just, in our case, the field of functions on the projective line. So you restrict your evaluation to the, to the field of functions of the projective line here. You're just going to get some positive scalar multiple 
of evaluation corresponding to some point in P1. Um, so we have a point in P1, um, this, this positive rational number H, this functional L on the weight lattice, and all the valuations that we're interested in correspond to triples consisting of, of these three things, P, L, and H. P is a point in P1, L is a functional of the weight lattice, H is a positive rational number. Now it's worth introducing some sort of subclasses of divisors that we're interested in, a sort of uh, classification of the different types of divisors that you can get. Um, so divisors whose restriction to the field of B invariance is trivial are called central. Um, so in these, case, in these cases, the, this restriction here is zero. So we have that H is equal to zero and this point P is actually arbitrary. So you can have um, different points P corresponding to the same valuation as long as H is zero. So that's something you have to keep track of. Um, otherwise, uh, recalling that colors are the divisors that are B stable, but not G stable. We call a color regular if its corresponding valuation has H coordinate equal to one under this classification. And we call it subregular if the H coordinate is greater than one. So, yeah, so as I mentioned, um, in our case, the this KB is always equal to the function field of the projective line. The reason for that is in all the cases that we're interested in, X is quasi-homogeneous. This means that the function field of G invariance is just constant. All the G invariants are constant. What this means is we have an open G orbit. And within that open G orbit, you have a one parameter family of codimension one B orbits that are going to be parameterized by the points of P1. So essentially what this means, given the, the existence of the open G orbit, um, since G is always a rational variety, it follows that X is rational, meaning that um, this field KB uh, is going to be the function field of a rational smooth projective curve of which the only one is the projective line. Um, yeah, so all of our examples are in this case. Now, given this, um, where the field of functions that are B invariant is the field of functions of a projected line, we have a rational B quotient pi, which is just a rational map from X to P1. This is just defined by choosing some, um, some B invariant rational function defines this rational map here. But well, crucially, this rational map then separates B orbits. So you take fibers of points in P1 under this map and you will get um, you will get B divisors on your variety. So the regular B divisors, those are the ones with H coordinate equal to one. These are just equal to the pullback of whichever point it is that, the, um, that they correspond to in P1, where the restriction, uh, that should say DP, the restriction of the valuation of DP to the field of B invariance is just equal to the valuation of this point. And DP itself is then just the pullback under pi of this point. Um, the subregular colors, those which have H coordinate greater than one, will appear within the pullbacks of these points, but they will have positive multiplicity. So if the pullback of this point contains a subregular color, it means that this fiber is non-reduced because it contains this subregular color with multiplicity greater than one. Um, and on the other hand, the central divisors, they will intersect the pullback of every point in, in P1. Um, so yeah, the, the, the different types of, of divisors here, the regular colors, the subregular colors, and the central divisors all kind of behave quite differently with respect to this B quotient map. Um, and this is quite useful to us later on. So I've said, I want to use this information to do a kind of combinatorial description of these varieties that generalizes um, the toric variety case with uh, cones and fans. So we have to have somewhere for these cones and fans to live. And this is where the excitingly named hyperspace comes in. So the hyperspace is just the collection of all of these triples here, right? We have a point of P1, a functional on the weight lattice and um, a positive rational number H, but we take into account the fact that when H equals zero, the point P is arbitrary. So you have a family of half spaces given by the dual of the weight lattice times the positive rational numbers indexed by points of P1. We take the union of all of them. And now each of these hyperspaces has a boundary hyperplane and we glue all of the boundary hyperplanes together. So I think the analogy that Timoshop uses for this is to imagine an open book. Um, each page of the book is a half space here. And then the, 
you glue an edge of each page all together in the spine of the book. So you have a page for each point in P1 and they're all glued together at the spine, which is this boundary hyperplane. Um, and this is where all of our cones and fans are going to live, but because they live in hyperspace, they're called hypercones and hyperfans. Um, so yeah, as mentioned, we know that these uh, G valuations and the valuations corresponding to colors correspond to triples given a point P, a functional L, and a positive rational number H. So these, these two sets map into the hyperspace. Um, the semi-invariant functions act as functionals on the hyperspace. Essentially, you just take a function, this, this triple here corresponds to a certain valuation, and then you just apply that valuation to the function. And that gives you, you can you kind of use F as a functional on the hyperspace. And in fact, if you use the proper definition of a functional on the hyperspace, then every functional is corresponds to up to positive scalar multiples anyway, um, a semi-invariant function. So the lunar Vus theory tells us that X is classified amongst all the other um, G varieties with the same function field by its collection of G stable sub varieties. Um, and in turn, these G stable sub varieties are determined by what is called their colored data. So if you have a G stable sub variety Y, you take all the G and B stable divisors D, which contain Y, you take the corresponding valuations of these divisors, which live in this set here, and that gives you the colored data of your subvariety Y. So the colored data is just the collection of valuations corresponding to the divisors which contain Y. Um, and these, this colored data will de you can uniquely determine the G-stable subvariety in question. So once we have embedded these valuations into the hyperspace, then we can use this colored data to define cones. So you just take um, the cone corresponding to this sub variety Y, you take um, all points such that functionals which are positive on the colored data of Y are positive on this point um, for all functionals. Then you say that this point is in the cone corresponding to Y. Um, and this is really similar to how the you know, cones are defined in terms of the toric case. But uh, they are, as I've said, hypercones because they live in the hyperspace. And then you have the collection of all the um, colored hypercones corresponding to all of the G-stable subvarieties of X um, gives you a colored hyperfan. And the normal G varieties of complexity one for a given fixed group G are classified by their colored hyperfans. So I'm going to work through. Well, okay, in a minute I'm going to work through an example to show what these color type funds actually look like. Um, so that's that's roughly how the um, classification of complexity 1G varieties actually works. Um, I'm applying this classification specifically to the case of smooth Fano SL23 fonts. So because I want to show the case stability of these varieties. Um, and SL23 folds are the sort of simplest interesting case of a complexity one action that isn't by a torus. Um, so the case of complexity one actions by toruses, uh, by tori has been solved already by Ilton and Seuss, as I've mentioned. So the, sim the next simplest case is SL2 acting on a threefold. So uh, Cheltsov, Prizhokovsky and Stromov classified the smooth final threefolds with infinite automorphism groups um, a couple of years ago. And so I can just go through their list find um, all the varieties whose automorphism groups are reductive because the non-reductive automorphism group variety is already known not to be k-stable. Um, focus on those that don't admit actions of two-dimensional or three-dimensional torus and look at those which admit SL2 actions. Then I can use this classification to calculate their combinatorial data and the colored hyperfan. And then my hope is to use that data to show the case stability of those varieties. So let's work through an example briefly and I'll sort of, we might be able to see a bit better what these colored hyperfans actually look like. So take them um, P3, the projective three space blown up along three disjoint lines. So we can realize P3 as the projectivization of a set of two by two complex matrices. And then we have SL2 act on this just by left matrix multiplication. 
you have the divisor here D of the singular matrices is going to be preserved by SL2. So that's a G-stable divisor. And it turns out to be central, which means the restriction of the valuation of D to the field of B invariant rational functions of this variety is trivial. Um, I should mention here, uh, when we take a Borel subgroup B of SL2, that's going to consist of the um, upper triangular matrices in SL2. Um, so given that B is the upper triangular matrices, uh, it, you can, it's not very difficult to see that the, um, if we give our points in P3 the coordinates X, Y, Z, and W, then Z and W are going to be semi-invariants um, with the weight given by, uh, that just picks out the top left element of a matrix in B, but they are semi-invariant at the same weight and their, their ratio is B invariant in this case. So this defines this B quotient map, the B invariant function Z over W, uh, and we can just map our elements of P3 down to P1 through this map. Um, turns out that the weight lattice is three billion of rank one generated by that character I mentioned before that picks out the top left entry of an element of B. Um, so given a point P in P1 with coordinates alpha and beta, we, we can take the pullback of P and it's gonna give us the vanishing of this function beta of Z, uh, beta times Z minus alpha times W. And these, it turns out for each point P, this gives you a regular color. So that each of these varieties here, each of these divisors is B stable and not G stable. Um, so each of, for each P we have a regular color given by this. Um, so now we can take that given, given some fixed P, we can take the intersection of this color DP with the divisor of singular matrices. This gives us YP, which is a line, is just the singular matrices whose kernel is the line corresponding to this point in P1. Um, so each of these YP is a G-stable line in P3. So in order to obtain our variety P3 bone up along three disjoint lines, we just pick three of those lines arbitrarily um, and blow them up. Since we're blowing up something that's G-stable, the uh, G action lifts upstairs to the blow up and the sizes that we get are also G-stable. Um, so what we then do is we take the strict transform of our divisor of singular matrices and we can intersect those with the uh, exceptional divisors and that gives us some new G-stable curves. So essentially we're in a situation where over each point in P1, other than these three, we have a G-stable curve given by the strict transform of this line. And over these three points, we have a G-stable subvariety given by this intersection here. So these are going to be the G-stable subvarieties that determine the colored hyperfan of our variety X, which looks like this. So this is a picture representing the different sort of slices of hyperspace corresponding to each point P and P1. Um, so for general points P and P1, those are the ones not equal to these three points. And I'll explain why this is different in a minute. We just have, here is our half space representing the sort of, you know, the page of the book corresponding to P in the analogy I mentioned earlier. We have the filled circles representing G-stable divisors. The unfilled circles are representing colors. Those are B-stable, but not G-stable. This dashed line represents the valuation cone. So we can see that this, the valuation cone goes to the left of this dashed line because the G-stable variety here is lying inside of it. And uh, this G-stable divisor is on the other boundary line. Um, and this hatched area with the black hatching is the um, colored hypercone of the G-stable curve that lies at the intersection of these two divisors. So you take these two divisors here, you take their intersection, you get a G-stable line, and then the hypercone corresponding to that G-stable line is just the cone in this slice that has boundaries give you rays. And the same in this slice here, um, you get this G-stable curve by intersecting the exceptional divisor with the strict transform of the singular matrices. You intersect these two and you get a G-stable curve. So the cone corresponding to that curve is just the cone bounded by these two rays. Um, the reason why P equals zero and infinity looks different to the general point P is 
down to the arbitrary choice of the splitting map that I mentioned earlier. So we have this split exact sequence where we um, assign to each weight an uh, arbitrary semi-invariant function of that weight. What that essentially means is you're going to get certain um, slices of the hyperspace where the color, if it lies in the divisor of that semi-invariant in question, has a different L coordinate to the general color, um, which have L coordinate of zero. So that's why these two slices look different. Uh, if we were to have chosen a different splitting map, that changes the appearance of this picture, but in a kind of strictly controlled way that's very easy to predict. But I, it's too like fiddly to get into right now. But anyway, this is what the colored hyperfan looks like for the blow up of P3 along three lines. So now that we've kind of discussed how this combinatorial description works, we can start thinking again about case stability. So I'm actually not going about case stability the donaldson futaki invariant, which has been the, the kind of standard method for a while. I'm using a new method called the beta invariant, which was introduced by um, Fujita and Lee, I believe independently of each other, um, a few years ago. So in order to talk about the beta invariant, I just have some other notions that I have to introduce. So let's say we have our variety X. We have a projective birational morphism from another variety Y, which is normal. Um, we call a prime divisor on Y a prime divisor over X. So prime divisor over X is just a prime divisor lying on some variety Y with a projective birational morphism going down to X. Um, Given one of these f, a prime divisor over x, there's a quantity called the log discrepancy of x over f, um, which I'm defining as the order of f in the relative canonical divisor of y over x plus 1. The um, birational geometers have a much more complicated definition of log discrepancy, I believe, that's useful in many more contexts. But in my specific context, this is the one that I need. Essentially, I am thinking of log discrepancy as the number of blowups I did to get from X to Y plus one. Um, but it is a much more useful concept than that. Um, but anyway, um, another quantity that we have to keep track of is the volume of a divisor. So if you have a divisor delta on X, you have your global sections of tens of powers of delta are gonna, um, you know, the dimension of this is gonna increase a bit as you increase K, you take further tens of powers, you'll get more global sections. You divide that by k to the n, and this n factorial is just a kind of normalization here, where, sorry, n is the dimension of x. You take the limit of this as k tends to infinity, and it gives you this notion of volume. Um, if you aren't familiar with this before, a sort of sanity check and fairly straightforward exercise is that if delta is ample, then the volume is actually equal to the degree of the top self-intersection number of delta. Um, it's a fairly easy exercise to do kind of shows in part why volume is a sensible word for this uh, property. So um, given that we've introduced the log discrepancy and the volume, the beta invariant of X, uh, well, the beta invariant of F over X is the log discrepancy multiplied by the anti-canonical degree of X, and then you're subtracting this integral. So this integral is basically, you um, pull back the anti-canonical divisor of X to Y, where F lives, and then you're subtracting multiples of f from from this divisor and then you're taking the volume so as you subtract multiples of f your number of your space of global sections is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller as you subtract larger and larger multiples of f and eventually it's going to go away and your divisor won't have any global sections anymore so this this taking progressively higher multiples of f gives you a function as you take the volume as a function of x and you can then integrate that from zero to infinity and because eventually you'll have no global sections this integral is finite um, and you're subtracting that from from this quantity here that gives you the beta invariant and Fujita and Lee showed that x is k-stable if and only if the beta invariant is positive for all prime divisors of x. Um, I'm trying to so this is just like a new alternative method to checking case stability that doesn't require you to look at test configurations directly and calculate the Futaki invariant directly, but I'll give you a vague sense of why this actually works. Um, so if a prime divisor F over X, you take R, the section ring of X and its anti-canonical divisor, 
that F introduces a filtration of R. Essentially, you're just filtrating, you're filtering by the order of vanishing of sections of this divisor on F. Um, there is a construction given, given the filtration of this ring R, there's a construction called the Rees algebra, where you introduce a dummy variable Z, and then, then you grade with respect to some power of Z, uh, each of these filtered pieces of R. If you take Z equal to minus one, you can see that in this case, there is an embedding of the polynomial ring in Z into A, the Rees algebra. So this induces a morphism pi from proj of A to the affine line. But we can also see if we take um, the, if we mod out, if we set Z equal to one, so we kind of take the quotient of, by the ideal Z minus one, we can see that um, R is actually a quotient of the Rees algebra. So we get an inclusion of proj of R into proj of A. But since R is the section ring of X and its anti-canonical divisor, X is equal to proj of R, this means that X embeds in proj of A and is in fact, it's fairly easy to check the pre-image of one in the affine line under this morphism. Since everything that we've defined here essentially respects the natural C star action on the affine line, it turns out that this map pi from proj of A to, A to the affine line is in fact a test configuration. This entire test configuration was induced by this filtration of R given by F. And it turns out, and I think, I assume this is a more difficult part of the proof that the um, beta invariant of F over X is then a positive multiple of the donaldson futaki invariant of this test configuration. So if this is positive, then the donaldson futaki invariant is positive. And if this is the case for all of them, then um, you get case stability. Okay, so I'm using this result to, to show case stability in the case of smooth Fano SL2 threefold. So this is my main result. This is a result I've proved in collaboration with my supervisor, Hendrik Suits. Um, we're saying let X be a smooth finer SL2 threefold. And we have these three conditions that I'll go into in more detail later. But essentially, if any of these three conditions hold, the main result is that X is case stable if the beta invariant is positive for all central SL2 stable prime divisors F over X. So Fujita and Lee say you need to check all prime divisors over X. But we already know that we only have to check the prime divisors which correspond to special test configurations. And by Datar and Zekel Hidi, we know that we only need to look at G invariant prime divisors over F when we have our G action on X. We want to look at uh, where Y has a G action, this uh, map sigma is also G equivariant, and then F is a G invariant prime divisor over X. And we also only need to make sure that the corresponding test configuration is special. But what I have done and Hendrik has done, we have shown you actually, in the, when these three cases hold, or sorry, any of these three cases hold, you only need to look at the central SL2 stable prime divisors. Um, so these three conditions are, if you have a finite group A acting on the projective line with no fixed points, or a finite group A interchanging two points on the projective line, which correspond to subregular colors of X, and then if the action of A that is induced on H preserves the color type of fan of X, those are the first two conditions. Or the third condition is that if X has subregular colors lying over three or more distinct points of P1, if any of those three hold, then we only need to check the beta invariant of the central prime divisors. The helpful thing is that one of these three conditions holds in almost every case. Uh, for any, almost any SL2 uh, variety, uh, one of these three is 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 true, um, and it is certainly true for all the ones that I'm interested in that aren't already known to be case stable by any other method. Um, so I'm going to give a, a vague idea of how these three proofs mean that we don't need to look at the beta invariant of the non-central divisors. Um, it's a lot more straightforward in case one than it is in case two and three, but the idea is fairly similar. Um, So we have this, so let's say we have this A action on P1. Um, this induces an action on the hyperfan. Essentially, you just take a point P L H and then you act on it. You're just permuting the point P with respect to whatever the action of A on P1 is. You're essentially just permuting around the different slices of the hyperspace um, by changing the point P 
according to however A acts on B1. So if this action that you get of A on the hyperspace preserves the colored hyperfine of X, then that means that you have lifted, you can lift the A action from P1 up to X. So then you have an A times G action on X. And then given a non-central prime divisor F, we know that it lies over some specific point PF in the projective line. And essentially what we want to do is show that given this A action, then this prime divisor F cannot be stable with respect to this A times G action that we now have. So if the A action has no fixed points, then in particular PF is not fixed, which means that F can't possibly be stable under this A times G action, because when we apply some element A to PF, we're going to get some other point. And, the, and so F is not stable under A times G. And then we just apply the dashar sekel heli theorem, which says that we only need to check the A times G stable divisors, since this group here is still going to be reductive given that A is finite, we can apply the theorem again. We only need to check the beta invariant of A times G stable divisors. And we've just shown that the non-central prime divisors can't possibly be A times G stable. So we only need to check the central divisors. So this is case one, when uh, a finite group acts on P1 with no fixed points. Cases two and three go quite differently. But in case two, the, a similar principle um, is applied. So. The idea in cases two and three is that um, if you have subregular colors, you have at least two subregular colors lying over points that are different to PF. What that does is it gives you non normality of the central fiber of the test configuration corresponding to X. And we mentioned way over towards the beginning, we only need to look at special test configurations, i.e., those which have normal central fiber. And I'm saying that if you have two subregular colors at points distinct from PF, then the corresponding test configuration is not normal central fiber and it can be ignored. Um, so the idea in case two, we have a finite group A interchanging two points in P1 corresponding to subregular colors of X. So given that, if it interchanges these two points, we know that a non-central divisor can't be A invariant because, well, a non-central divisor that lies over one of those two points can't be A invariant because those two points are interchanged rather than fixed. So a non-central divisor can only be invariant under A if the corresponding point is fixed by A. So essentially what this means is in case two, we are guaranteeing that at these two points at least, we have subregular colors and we know that they can't be the same point as corresponds to F because they aren't fixed by the A action. Um, in case three, is just X has some regular colors lying over three or more distinct points of P1. So whichever point PF lies over, or whichever point F lies over, there are always two other points which have a sub regular color over them. And our theorem says that um, when there are two sub regular colors over these different points, we get non normality of the corresponding test configuration. So if either of these two hold, we also only have to check central divisors for the, for the beta invariant. Um, and essentially, these three cases, which one of them is true, essentially depends on you have your SL2 action on X and it has an open G orbit. So that open G orbit is a homogeneous space for SL2. It's isomorphic to SL2 mod some finite subgroup H. And essentially, depending on which finite subgroup H of SL2 you get, will determine which of these two, which of these three conditions hold. But almost always one of them does. Um, so we only have to check the central prime divisors. This is very convenient because there is actually always only one central prime divisor. So we only have to check the beta invariant for one thing. So the central divisors, as I explained, are mapped to the central hyperplane of the hyperspace. In the case of SL2, because the weight lattice is rank one, this is just a line. And because the colored hyperfan and the colored hypercones have to be strictly convex and they can't overlap each other, um, there can only be at most one central divisor. So look at this picture here. We have the one central divisor here corresponding to this ray. Any other central divisor would either have to correspond to the same ray or this opposite ray. And in either case, you would either um, have cones overlapping or non-strictly convex cones, and both of those are not allowed. So there's only one central divisor over an SL2 threefold. Um, and in fact, there always exists a central divisor as well. 
which is obtained by a sequence of finite elementary blowups. So you have you have a G invariant curve, you blow it up, you get an exceptional divisor. And after doing this finitely many times, you will get an exceptional divisor, which is central. Um, so it's really easy to find the central divisors. If you don't already have them, you just have to do some blow ups. Um, so then we want to calculate the beta invariant of the central divisor. And this is also made fairly simple, again, by Timoshev. Um, given a divisor delta on complexity one variety x, he has uh, found a formula which calculates the volume of delta. Uh, he was using it for intersection numbers, but it works just as well for the volume. Um, and this formula only uses the root system of G and some bits of combinatorial data uh, of delta that are very easy to find once you have the colored hyperfan. So calculating the volume becomes very easy with this formula. And calculating beta is very easy with the volume because you just have to integrate the volume. You need the anti-canonical degree, which is in the paper by Chelsov, Prizhokovsky, and Shramov, and the log discrepancy, which, as I've said, is just the number of blowups you did plus one. Um, so that makes calculating beta of the central divisor quite straightforward. So I'm not going to do an example calculation because the Timoshev formula is fairly complicated, but I'll talk about how the theorem actually applies to the example we've seen already, the blowup of P3 along three lines. So, so you have your X, you've blown up these three lines, YQ, YR, and YS. You realize P1 as the sphere, and then you um, let Q, R, and S be the vertices of an equilateral triangle inscribed in the sphere. You look at the rotations of the sphere preserving this equilateral triangle, which is just S3. Um, and then that acts on the sphere as a whole with no fixed points. Um, the poles of the sphere are going to be an orbit of order two. The vertices of the triangle Q, R, and S are going to be an orbit of order three. And every other orbit is just some orbit of order three or six. Um, but there are, crucially, there are no fixed points. So we can apply part one of the theorem, provided that the action of A fixes the colored hyperfine of X. So here is the colored hyperfine of X. We have looked at this before. Um, so Q, R, S are the vertices of the triangle, and they lie in an orbit. But the, hyper, the um, picture of the hyperfine is the same across each of these points, S. So when you permute these three points, you're permuting these three, three slices of the hyperfine, but each of these slices looks exactly the same as each other. So that part is preserved. Um, when we, if we can, we can freely set zero and infinity to be the poles of the sphere, since zero and infinity have the same picture in the hyperspace as well, when we permute them with the S3 action, um, again, this part of the hyperfine is preserved. And then all the remaining points will fill out all these other orbits of orders three and six. And again, each of these points in the general case has the same picture of the hyperfine. So this S3 action we have on P1 fixes the colored hyperfine of X. So it lifts to an action on X of S3. Um, and so we know that only the central divisors can be S3 times SL2 invariant. So all we have to do now to show the case stability of this example is calculate the beta invariant of this divisor D tilde. And the formula of Shav tells us that this beta invariant is 11. So P3 blown up along three lines is case stable. Give another example that illustrates part two of our theorem. Um, take the divisor of tri degree 1, 1, 1 on P1 times P1 times P2. You'll have to take my word for it that the color type of fan looks like this. Um, we can see here this color D0 lies at height 2, so is subregular. And this color D infinity is also at height 2, so is subregular. So we have two subregular colors lying over these points P0 and P equals infinity. We can see that the slices of hyperspace here at zero and here at infinity look the same as each other. So we want to look at case two, a finite group interchanges two points in V1 corresponding to subregular colors of X. So we want a finite group interchanging <clears throat> P equals zero and P equals infinity. Um, we also have to be careful because this slice of P equals minus one is unique. None of the other slices look like this. So we have to make sure that also our action fixes minus one. This is very straightforward to do. <clears throat> we let A be the cyclic group of order two, and we act on P1 by just involution that uh, flips the two coordinates. So this fixes one and minus one. So this slice here that doesn't look like any of the other ones is fixed. Um, it interchanges zero and infinity, which are the slices 
containing these two subregular colors. And then every other point is in an orbit of order two. And these slices all look the same as each other. So this A action by involution, again, lifts to the full variety X and it interchanges two points, both of which correspond to a subregular color. So by part two of our theorem, again, we only need to check the beta invariant of a central divisor. Now we can see here, there isn't actually a central divisor um, on this variety there, it would have to lie here at this uh, minus one point, but it doesn't. Um, but thankfully all we have to do is do an extra blow up and we obtain the central divisor. So this, these uh, G divisors E, F and Delta all intersect in a single G invariant curve. When we blow that curve up, the exceptional divisor is central. So we just have to calculate its beta invariant using the um, formula of Timoshev, um, and we get a value of 28. It means this divide, this variety, the divisor of tri-degree 1, 1, 1 on P1 times P1 times P2 is K-stable. Uh, part three of our theorem is illustrated by this variety, the blow up of Q along the twisted quartic. So you take the um, quadric hypersurface in P4, you blow it up along a twisted quartic curve. As long as you choose the right quadric hypersurface and the right quartic curve, you get an SL2 action on the blow up and the colored hyperfan looks like this. Now over zero, we have this divisor here at height two, which is subregular. We have a divisor here at height three, which is subregular. I have a divisor here at height three again, which is subregular. So we have three subregular colors lying over distinct points in P1. So we can apply part three of our theorem and show that we only need to check the beta invariant of a central divisor. Again, the central divisor is just found by blowing up these G invariant curves you get by intersecting the G invariant divisors. And you find again that the beta invariant is 46. So the blow up of Q along the twisted quartic is also K stable. So this method that I myself and Hendrik Zeus have found, basically it can be used to show the case stability of these varieties. These are listed according to the numbering of the Mori Mukai classification of finite threefolds, which is the same numbering used in the paper of Chelsov, Kriyakovsky, and Shramov. Um, and these are the varieties, one sec. These are the varieties that I've applied to show the case stability of. I've highlighted in green the ones which, to my knowledge, were not already known to be case stable by any other method. So that's uh, these three examples we've discussed, as well as the blow up of P3 along a twisted cubic and the blow up of divisor W on P2 times P2 along a curve of by degree 2, 2. And um, some of these with daggers illustrate that there is actually like a family of varieties and only one example within the family is actually admitting an SL2 action. But these are the varieties I've used and showed the case stability of using this method or that I can do. Um, yeah, so, so it works in, in quite a few cases. But some of these, you know, are already known to be case stable because they're like a toric or admit a two torus action or something like that. Um, so the next steps in this kind of research program um, would be essentially, I'm gonna check the applic applicability of um, my main theorem to whether it applies to kind of wider classes of class 2 one finos. I'm not completely, I'm not completely sure it should only work for the case of SL2 threefold, but that's the only context in which I've proved it. Um, I think it should probably generalize quite easy to um, fit slightly larger examples. I just haven't quite done that yet. Um, it would be a lot easier to do this if I had an explicit formula for the anti-canonical divisor. There are like, in the spherical case, complexity zero case, there is a known formula for the anti-canonical divisor. Um, it makes it quite easy to calculate and that would uh, help me out with this. Again, I could try looking at GL2 fourfolds would be the next most simple uh, example of complexity one varieties to look at. Um, but again, also there is a, in the in the complexity zero case, there is a criterion for case stability that works in every case that's sort of, and same with the toric case, is defined by looking at where a barycenter of a certain polytope lives. Um, in the case of complexity one, it's just an issue of working out exactly what that polytope should be and what the barycenter in respect to what measure. I think we, me and Hendrik know, or Hendrik knows which measure we should be looking at, but it's for kind of finding the right polytope to check the barycenter of, and then actually proving that that shows case ability. But those are those sort of next things I want to do on this uh, research program. So yeah, uh, that's everything. Uh, thank you very much um, to Ivan Cheltsov for inviting me to speak and for 
the rest of the organizers for putting the seminar on and for all of you for being here. Um, if there are any questions, mm -hmm. I'll thank do my Jack. best. Thank you. Let's thank Jack first. It was a very nice, actually, organized talk. Let me clap on Zoom like this. Thank you. So, uh, questions to Jack. Yeah. Uh, I, I have, okay, first question, which is basically related to the slide. So, which, do you have any GL2 fourfold in mind? Uh, no, not something I've, like, I, d I don't know off the top of my head which ones I would look at. Um, I just, I know that that would be the next most simple case, but I haven't, it's not something I've put any time into looking at. I just thought it would be a kind of obvious next move, but um, I don't have any specific examples in mind. Um, I would have to think about it a bit more. So in many examples, which you mentioned, basically if you take the full automorphism group, so extension of PGL2, uh, then uh, mm. in most of them you actually have very few finitely many uh, divisors gene variant divisors over x yeah yeah so i think the only exception is divisor by degree one one two in p one one p two i think in this case you have infinite yeah infinite. Um, yeah maybe if you yeah, scroll so... back yeah 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 so the only, yeah, the only example in which I have combinatorial data, the only example in which I have a colored hyperfine in which I couldn't get um, any of these three conditions to hold mm -hmm. was um, this divisor on P1 times P1 times P2. So it works for the divisor, but essentially you obtain this divisor by blowing up P1 times P2. Mm -hmm. And in the case of P1 times P2, I couldn't, I couldn't get any of my three methods to work. Um, okay, so as far as I wasn't I sure myself why that was. Yeah, Jack, as far as I understand, maybe you could, uh, just to confirm what I said, uh, I think uh, your conditions, which listed on the previous slides, basically means that you have finitely many yeah. uh, gene variant divisors. And then in this case, you just basically yeah. compute beta for them. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's the idea, yeah. But, uh, yeah, and for 317? Yeah, the, 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 it's finite and many invariant divisors over your variety, so it's on every possible. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that's for why you have to reduce it to finite group, and many so that you yeah. can actually check. Mm -hmm. For 317, the group is small. Okay. I think it's PGL2 uh, and uh, multiply by Z2, yeah? You swap yes, the so. factors of P1. And then in this case, you have a lot of, uh, yeah. not a lot, infinitely many G invariant prime divisors over x so you have to go okay can you br yeah, br the briefly uh, uh, like in the translation to in more geometric translation uh, explain how you deal with this case yeah for 317 um the 317 uh, how exactly do you mean sorry no no no, no. Uh, you, you mean you proved uh, you got k polystability of this, yeah? Yes. Yeah, but uh, you, you said that your, all your three conditions is not applicable, yeah, in this case? Oh, no, sorry. What I meant was, no, in, in, this, in this case, condition two is applicable. Um, oh, okay. Okay, okay. What I meant was <clears throat> you obtain this divisor by blowing up P, you obtain this variety, sorry, by blowing mm -hmm. up just P1 times P2. Yes. And I couldn't work out how to apply any of my three conditions in that case, the case of just P1 times P2. Um, okay. But that's already known to be case stable because it's, I think it's either toric or admits a two torus action. Yeah. So yeah. that case is already covered. In this case, you apply condition two. It doesn't matter that there are infinitely many prime G stable prime divisors mm -hmm. over X because you can show that. Um, as long as there are, um, yeah, so the idea is you, because of the existence of these two subregular colors, I and see. the fact that you're interchanging these two points, that the G-stable prime divisors that are also stable under Z2, they can't lie over these two points. So they can lie over the right. So yeah. you can lie over any other point, but they can't lie over these two. 
yeah, yeah, and yeah. then the crucial part of my argument in um, section two, uh, in part two of the theorem, is that um, if there are these two subregular colors and your prime divisor lies over one of the other points, then the um, test configuration corresponding to that prime divisor is not a special test configuration, so you can ignore it. I so see. even if there are infinitely many, ah, if they, if they all lie over these points, Okay. If they all lie over these points, then you don't need to look at their test configuration because the central fiber isn't normal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's the difficult part of my argument is actually using these subregular colors. Essentially, it goes through you. Um, the B quotient gives you like a correspondence of like B semi invariant sections of the anti canonical divisor mm -hmm. uh, down to uh, sections of certain divisors on P1, but there are Q divisors on P1. And essentially, when these Q divisors have um, non-integral points at certain at certain points, if they have more than two uh, non-integral coefficients at points distinct from the point where your divisor lies over, then when you take the um, mm -hmm. when you take the Ries algebra of the filtration given by this divisor F, you you can essentially use the, the um, fact that there are these non-integral points in the Q divisor on P1 mm -hmm. to construct um, mm -hmm. construct functions, which then give you like non-normality of those rings. So this is uh, the, to make these, most, <laughs> these rings this is the most difficult post. case, yeah. This is the most. Well, yeah, so it's the same in cases two and three. Two and three are, are more difficult. Um, so. Yeah, case one essentially just you show that the non-central divisors can't be a times g invariant at all, so you can just ignore them straight away. Okay. Uh, case two, you're essentially saying as long as they're not invariant over this point, then it's fine. And case three is just saying, well, you can always choose two extra points. But uh, it's the fact that these subregular colors give you non-normality of the test configurations that's the difficult part of the argument. Okay. No, uh, this is good. Yeah, now it's now it's very clear. Yeah, did you try to apply to singular triples? Sorry. Do, did you try to apply your result to th singular triples? Because with singular no, no, triples, I have you have more choices. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that would be an interesting other direction to go in, to go along with it in, but I I haven't tried that okay. myself now. Um, and I probably should do it at some point, but yeah, that's not something I've looked into, but would probably be quite okay. interesting. Okay. Oh, um, yeah. Perfect. Thank you. So, uh, any other questions to Jack? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. If there are no more questions, uh, let's thank Jack again. Uh, thank you, Jack. It was actually very nice uh, talk. Uh, very well prepared. Thank you very much. It was very clear, crystal clear. Yeah. Thank Good. you. Good. Yeah. No, thank you for saying so, and thank you for inviting me. Yeah, my pleasure. And uh, I upload the Great. video later today to the Zach Seminar webpage. Okay, good. See everyone next week. Yeah, next should week. I um, mm -hmm. should I send you a PDF of the slides as well? Would that be helpful? This would be better. Yeah, well, I, I I can upload both. Yeah, I'll I'll email you the slides. Thank you, Jack. Thanks. Okay. Thanks everyone. Right, thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye.